Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Dr. Judy Butler. She has a service called Guardian's Gift, and we're going to talk about that today and why it's important and why it's something we should all consider doing. So thanks for joining me, Judy. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your community. I am so excited to be here. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about you and your previous caregiving history, because I find that probably 98% of my guests all have been caregivers in the past or are still currently caregiving. Um, First of all, I am an ordained pastor. And I served in uh, a local church, one of our local parishes, as the the, uh, pastor for senior adults. So I worked with the senior adult community for over 15 years. So I'm very familiar with that aspect of families and caregiving in that arena, at least from an outside perspective as a pastor. Uh, Personally, uh, I have been the secondary caregiver to my mother being primary caregiver for my dad who had dementia and began his decline somewhere around 2009, 2010. And um, as he progressed through the dementia, my mother, uh, of course, they were both aging and mother began to have difficulties taking care of him and you know, the financial, emotional, physical aspects of that. So I began stepping in more and more as uh, we children, adult children often do. And uh, and my dad passed the day after Christmas on 2018. So he's been gone two years this past Christmas, just now. And uh, I am now the caregiver for my mom, who is 85. And um, she has macular degeneration and lots of physical ailments. She still does really well. But I'm also uh, back up for my husband caring for his parents who were in their early 80s, both of them, and his grandmother, who was 101. And uh, so it's a, a family affair, if you will. We, we're looking after a lot of elderly and aging family members. Well, I have you slightly beat. My grandmother is almost 103. Oh, way to go, Grandma. <laughs> yeah, she'll be 103 at the end of March. So, and she, well, his- she, her mind is still good, but she's mostly blind from glaucoma and very profoundly hard of hearing, which those two situations don't help your brain at all. But yeah, she's still hanging in there. <laughs> so, my husband's grandmother is sharp as a tack. She physically is declining and can't get around real well. But she walks with a walker and she takes care of her own self. We have caregivers, of course, that stay with her. But she's sharp. She is really sharp. I said, I want to be like her when I grow up. (laughs) So I always joke, and this is not not untrue at all. I totally inherited the fat gene from my dad's side of the family. And it is my paternal grandmother that is still with us. So since it's my mom's side of the family that has all of the brain issues, and I got the bad stuff from my dad's <laughs> side of the family. Hoping I at least got the the good longevity gene because my maternal grandmother lived to ninety one with vascular dementia. So, oh yeah. <laughs> so there's longevity. I just would like longevity and memories. I understand. You know, my dad had vascular dementia, um, and part of his was due to poor living choices, poor lifestyle choices. He smoked the entire time. And so, um, you know, a lot of that was due to uh, strokes that he had, many strokes, which directly related to his smoking, I feel like. Well, my grandmother had an aneurysm that leaked for three months. So her, she didn't have the, her lifestyle choices were pretty good based on the aneurysm happened in 96. So we know a lot more now, 25 years later. Yeah, I think, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> so, you know, she, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather had a wicked sweet tooth, which I also inherited. We know that sugar is not good for our brains. So it's not good for any part of us. It actually, um, <laughs> they've done scientific research to prove that uh, sugar that we all love dearly, some more than others, it has inflammatory properties. It actually causes inflammation 
and makes our joints hurt, our muscles hurt, makes our brain foggy. So, so yeah, there's there's a lot that goes with sugar. But as we age, what I've seen with a lot of the senior adults and um, myself included is that we tend to, I guess, gravitate more and more and have a desire, a larger desire for sugar. So it's really tough as we age. Um, I had a lady who was a dietitian and they were having trouble getting my dad to eat properly. And she said, look, if I can get him to eat vegetables and it has to put syrup on it, then so be it. <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> like, well, I don't think he's going to eat that. But um, but the whole her whole point was, if you have to put sugar in everything to get him to eat, then OK. I do know that that's the last taste that dies, in, mm-hmm. you know, as we age. I'm in trouble because. I have a wicked sweet tooth. I I have it wrestled under control most of the time. <laughs> but if it if it gets worse as I age, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> well, it is a constant wrestling match that we have to, you know, stay on top of because if it ever gets on top of us, we're doomed. So That is very true. My mom was a huge huge well, first she drank 2 liters of diet coke a day, which oof. And there was always candies around. Yeah. And she broke more teeth on sticky candy than any one person should be allowed to do. So <laughs> it was definitely not good for her brain. And she maintained her body weight without much exercise, unlike me. Because <laughs> I said, I inherited the fat gene. So, you know... Her eating was not great. And my dad was a horrible, horrible eater. Oof. He could have been satisfied with a fried hamburger patty, mashed potatoes, and corn or peas every night for dinner the rest of his life. Yeah, we really get stuck in ruts as we age. And part of it is familiarity, but part of it has to do with our changing taste, too, I think. He was just really fussy. I mean, he didn't like onions or garlic or sauces or... <laughs> Yes, he. You didn't take him to fancy restaurants because he didn't appreciate it, and that and that was just who he was his whole life. Yeah. So tell us about Guardian's gift because you you told me a little bit offline the other day, and it sounds fantastic. So we should just dive right in before we go off on this brain health tangent. <laughs> Uh, Well, that's part of the Guardian's gift is evaluating that, but um, the Guardian's gift was born out of the struggles that I went through caring for my dad and mom. Um, It started, actually, I realized when I was sitting in the Department of Social Services one day, and I was sitting there looking around. I had an attorney that I had hired sitting with me, and the whole purpose of me being there was to get dad or keep dad in a nursing home because mom couldn't look after him anymore. She couldn't physically, mentally, financially, or emotionally care for him. And so he was in a nursing home. And uh, the Department of Social Services, I don't know if your listeners are aware, but if you go into a nursing home and your finances are limited um, or non existent, even. If you own anything, they want to uh, you to sign that over to them to help offset the cost. And so when that was presented to my mother as an option to pay for dad's nursing home bill, my mother was like, no, there's no way because I, I've worked my entire life. This is all I have. And I, I'm not going to give up my house. And of course, she was looking at it a little uh, sideways. But uh, long story short. We put the house in a trust. A lot of people don't understand about trusts and wills and things like that. And the guardian's gift helps them with that. But we put the house in a trust and we were able to keep dad in a nursing home. We had to have a hearing. I had to hire an attorney. One year, I spent $35,000 of my own retirement money to help look after my parents. And these are things that people find, um, and I hear it all the time, that when you become a caregiver... You start out with small things. Maybe you go to the grocery store. Maybe you pick up a medication. But eventually, somehow, it begins to creep up, and we find that we're spending more and more money. But as I sat there that day, I was looking around, and I thought, you know, I'm a fairly intelligent woman. I have a doctorate degree. I can afford to hire an attorney to sit here with me. 
you know, what about these other people that are here? And I thought nobody should ever have to go through all the red tape, headaches, all the misery and suffering that I personally went through looking after my parents. I thought, you know what? I got to do something. I have to create something that will, will help people be more organized, be able to make decisions sooner, earlier in the process, and get things organized and prepared so that their family members don't have to go through it. So when dad passed away on the day after Christmas, I found myself standing at his casket. I couldn't even cry. Mm. I was so tired. I was exhausted. I was worn out from the, the mental stress, the financial stress, the emotional turmoil, the roller coaster. And I thought, this is not happening. If I can keep anybody else from going through this, then that's what's going to be. So I created the Guardian's Gift. Um, and it's an A to Z. It's a comprehensive. It has got so much detail. And what it is, the service is it, we start out helping people tell their stories. People don't like to talk about death and dying. That's people, true. Are very, people are very superstitious and they think if they talk about it, it's going to happen. Well, I got news for you. It's going to happen anyway. It is true. Well, talking about it won't bring it on sooner. So if we talk about it up front, and we prepare and we get everything done, organized and taken care of up front, then it really is such a relief to family members on the back end. I start people out. I get them to start telling me their stories. Like, Where were you born? Tell me about your childhood. And we just collect the stories along the way with documentation. The documentation is their birth certificate. It's diplomas, it's certificates or awards they've earned, it's pictures. So we collect all that going through the process until I get to the point where they currently are in life. And the Guardian's Gift actually covers and helps people of different categories and age groups. So wherever they happen to be at the moment, then we begin to, to pivot and look towards the future. And I ask the questions like, well, what happens if you get sick? Who's going to pay your bills if you're alone or if your partner or spouse has some sort of health condition or dementia that they're dealing with? What's going to happen and who's going to pay those bills? And a lot of people don't understand that there are so many financial regulations that their children, adult children and or whoever they want to be their uh, power of attorney cannot access certain things unless it's set up a specific way. So I help people understand how that works and what it looks like. Um, and it's not, sometimes it's not simply enough to have their name on your checking account. That may seem like a simple answer, but it's a little more complicated because the federal government gets involved. <laughs> they have rules and regulations. I wish so my I dad had thought about that because his donated kidney was failing and he did not want to go back on dialysis, which I understood. And I accepted that, but he didn't tell anybody that he was at the point <clears throat> that he needed to be on dialysis. And we showed up at his house and he thought this was in 2016. He thought it was 1998. And yeah. the only reason that we got any kind of access to their finances is my husband. Let's see. My dad is, was a Rotarian. My husband and I are Rotarians. My dad's financial planner was a Rotarian. My husband worked in banking for 20 years prior to real estate. And he was, he'd was he been through this with clients in the banking world. And so he called the financial planner and basically told him what was going on. And that was probably not the most kosher route, but it kept it kept things going and it was one less crisis for my sister and I to deal with because that is I've known my husband since 1987 yeah holy hell <laughs> <laughs> that's been so long it sounded strange <laughs> and he's been dealing with banking for me since basically like 1988 so it's like or maybe even 87 we met in February so yeah I just I don't like banks if I could do, put my money in the mattress and pay online I'd be really happy with that so it's, you know, it's, 
not just to protect you, but it also keeps squabbles from happening, I would hope. And so that's that's something else. Um, I'll, I'll speak about that in just a second. But so when that person gets to a particular place in the process of the guardian's gift, we actually look to the future and I start asking those kinds of questions. You know, what's going to happen? And your example is wonderful. That is just absolutely wonderful because most people don't know those things. You're, you were very fortunate to have someone in banking. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people really don't understand. So when they get it explained to them in conversation that they can understand, they're like, oh, OK, well, let me take care of that. And it's simple if you do it on the front end. Uh, but what happens is they wait till they're in a crisis and then they try to fix it. And it's, it's a lot more headache and problems. So I start asking the questions, well, if you were to, you know, end up in the hospital or to need to go to a nursing home or to have long term care of some sort, how are you prepared? So we look at their financial situation. I look at their physical situation. I ask questions about their physical health. I have a um, degree in uh, medical laboratory. And so I worked for 35 years. My first career was in the hospital. So I'm very familiar with the terminology, the lab tests, the results, all of the jargon, if you will. So I help them sort through that. And we actually talk about what is your prognosis going forward? You know, if you're 80 years old and you've already been diagnosed with dementia, if you're in a moment where I can have that conversation, what would you like to happen going forward? Because it's not going to get better. So let's let's just be honest. And I have to have that honest conversation. And this is I'd like to take a second sort of step to the side here about conversations, because that's one thing that I do help people and families with adult children sometimes don't want to talk about mom or dad and their condition and them dying or what's going to happen. But the reverse is also true. Sometimes mom or dad or whoever wants to talk about it or doesn't want to talk about it. So I help people and families have those conversations. And sometimes we have to talk about the family member who is the quote unquote black sheep and or maybe has an addiction problem or maybe there's some other issues. Maybe they're just, uh, they have mental or behavioral health issues. So we talk about those kinds of things and we put that on the table for the family to actually grapple with. And if you grapple with that and wrestle with that on the front end, we can take care of putting things in place. You don't have to deal with it on the back end. So this is about being prepared ahead of time. I actually help people go through and create the their end of life service. Um, we talk about the options and what that looks like and what they'd like to have happen. So many adult children come to me, especially when I'm working with a family where someone's deceased. And I'll say, OK, let's plan the service. I'll say, what kind of music? What, you know, where are they going to be buried? What's going to happen? Are they going to be cremated? And the children are like, I wish they had planned this out. I hate having to decide this. I really don't know. And so if, if you know, it's a gift. That's why it's called the guardian's gift. If you will do this ahead of time, we actually go all the way A to Z. I get passwords, PIN numbers, account numbers. Everything goes toward creating a book. And I put the book together or they put the book together. And then we present it to the entire family or whoever they want to. And uh, we sit down and talk about what's in it. That way, people are all on board. They're, they know what's going to happen. They know what this person wants. And um, it's just really amazing. It's really a lot of fun. I love hearing the stories. People love telling the stories. And uh, when they start talking about their death and their end of life service, then the family members are included. We kind of joke about it a little bit. And people say, well, I'm going to stand you up in the corner and just, you know, we're going to have you embalmed and put you in the corner. And or the grand, the parent will say, well, I'm going to come back and haunt you. You know, we kind of joke about it a little bit. But that sounds like what my mom would say. My yeah. my dad basically, well, he planned, he got a, his, he was super frugal, which is fine. And I'm not, 
a big person on actual, I'm much more accepting of cremation than burying somebody. My paternal grandfather has a lead lined coffin, you know, in the cement lined hole. It just it doesn't seem quite right to me. And, you know, land in California is precious and expensive. So yes. I, I joke, well, I, we've all decided to be cremated, but I'm like, you can just ball me up and make me into the tree. That's a, that's a new thing, which my daughter would consider. So that's kind of up to her, but we're not going to do burials, but my dad planned out his cremation and he had, you know, the military cemetery, which was probably cheaper than other cemeteries because he'd been in the Marines for four years. And then it was like, my husband and I planned it with, because he'd been in um, four different rotary clubs, we had each club bring their banners and they're like four by six feet. So they're quite large because, you know, my, grand, my dad didn't need a whole bunch of flowers and that's expensive and it wasn't him. And in going through his paperwork, we found the obituary that he wrote for himself, which I laugh because it was very lengthy. My husband tried to edit it down. It was still a thousand dollars to run it in the paper. <laughs> oh my Which, god! Yeah, my oh, it was it was huge. It was at least it was a full eight and a half by eleven piece of paper typed mm -hmm. out. So, but he, you know, and it was nice because I was I was like, I don't even know where to start with that. And I'm a pretty good writer, and I opted not to do one for my mom because I felt, you know, the people that needed to know knew. And had I known that, you know, nearly a year later, we still can't do a service for her thanks to this insane pandemic, I probably would have. She was in Seroptimus, the women's service organization, and they sent out a newsletter and there was all kinds of information. So it was like a quasi obituary in there for her. But finding my dad's obituary was were such a relief. And then I don't know why my husband took to editing it, but that's what happened. And it really is a benefit. And then my paternal grandmother, who's almost 103, my, my, her husband, my grandfather, they, he planned out everything and he passed away in 1997. So it's been, it's been a, the what plans have been in the works for a very long time. Right. Seven sounds like a long time ago too. So well, yeah, and, and then the one conversation we didn't have, with my dad was I found out after his mind was in a different decade is that he he thought my mom would just come live with me. And that was never discussed, which I've talked about a lot because, you know, I had just turned 50. My daughter had finally moved out. So it was like, no, not I'm not interested in spending the next 10 to 15 years of my life dealing with my mom. Now, if I'd known it was three years, I might have had a different opinion. I don't know. It's hard mm -hmm. to know. Yeah. But Conversations are extremely important, and that's one thing that I I talk about on social media and on the podcast. I talk about it everywhere, so that's why I like what you're doing because it sounds it sounds more enjoyable. Well, it's really you know people when I say that I help <clears throat> with uh, end of life planning, people go oh you know, and I'm like no, it's really we talk about all the stories, and you know when I ask well how did you meet your spouse or and they tell they they just immediately go right into that time period, and they start telling me about their their first love or their first kiss, or um, and they talk about their jobs, and it's just those are the things, those memories. And I know your podcast is fading memories, but those things are the ones that people would pay a fortune to have, and they have lost them. Mm -hmm. Because when that person dies, they die with them. And so I'm like, you know, this is so important to me. The stories that my dad told me about his life and the stories that I will leave for my children and grandchildren. And uh, I'm really a huge genealogy fan. I love doing genealogy. It's a hobby of mine. And so when I go looking for information and I find a little tidbit of a, a letter or a story somewhere, it just makes it more real. You know, it brings that person. And I think that's part of what our eternity is about, is about being remembered and our story told at some point. So it's, it's just amazing. You know, there's a lot of areas that we look at in the guardian's gift. I look at their physical, as I said, and we talk about their health. 
And I look at their physical in terms of where they're living and what that looks like and <clears throat> whether they need to move into something downsized or closer to loved ones or into an assisted living or into a nursing home and how much that cost. Uh, so we look at the financial part. You know, the cost is huge. There was a study done in 2013. And of course, that's what almost eight years now. That's yeah. long. I know. Uh, it doesn't sound uh, like that long ago, but it is. Yeah. Uh, it cost $470 billion, with a B, billion dollars for the unpaid care. Now, I'm talking about care that family members give for caregiving. That is bigger than all of the money paid for Medicaid in that same year, and it matches Walmart's budget, $477 billion. That's a lot of money. Yeah. You know, and the other thing is that we look at, um, so there's the physical, the fiscal, the money. We also look at um, the logical, you know, what is it, what is it logically like? What's going to happen? We be try to be realistic. Then we look at the organization, is all their things organized? Well, my mother told me, you know, I'm the oldest child, and I always knew I'd be the one who'd have to do all this, being the oldest, especially a, a female. Mm -hmm. uh, Mom said, you know, all that stuff's in the top drawer and the chest in there. So when I went in there and I opened the jet chest drawer, I was like, oh, okay, I'll do this later. And close <laughs> the drawer. Um, and part of it is that, you know, everything was in there except that it was just a big jumble. So I actually, you know, have gone through and organized it. So the Guardian's Gift does that for everybody. It, it organizes it in a fashion that, you know, is straightforward. It's easy. It makes sense. It flows from birth to death. You know exactly where to look for uh, who to call. You know, people don't think about that. Well, do, did we call Aunt Susie? that lives in Nebraska. Uh, well, no, maybe we didn't. Do I have her number? I don't know. Do you have her number? Who has her number? How do we reach Aunt Susie in Nebraska? But it's it's amazing. So it's just organized. So we look at that. And then we look at the spiritual. As a pastor, one of the things that's important, and I served as a chaplain for five years in the hospital. So I serve all faith systems. So I can talk with anyone about any of their faith or not faith. Some people have no faith. But we talk about it, and a lot of people, especially towards the end of life and or with a medical diagnosis that's terminal, I have the ability to work with them around what does that mean for them? You know, what is it? What are they thinking? How do they feel about that? And this is a time that families, uh, they have difficult time discussing that. So then we look at the psychological, the family systems, the dynamics that exist in families, and we talk about all of that. You know, as the oldest and a, being a female, let me just say 75% of all caregivers are female. Mm -hmm. And um, Alzheimer's and dementia affects women more. That always amazes me. Like my support group is well, it's not quite as big as it was when we could meet in person, but we'd have upwards of 25 people and probably 22 to 23 of them would be women. Right. And when you know that like two thirds of people living with Alzheimer's are women, it's like, this is sort of backwards, but I don't think men seek out assistance as much as they should. I know my dad didn't. He didn't even accept it from my sister and I much. No, I suggested that, you know, because because of his chronic illnesses, you know, and he didn't have a lot of patients ever. But when you don't feel good and somebody's asking you the same freaking question 14 times, it's very difficult to be keep keep calm. And he didn't manage that very well. And so I was I had strongly encouraged him to to enroll mom in the adult day program. And I did all the research. I talked to them and I felt like it was a good thing for both of them. And I could not even get him to go meet with them. And I know from after he passed away and my mom was in memory care, that was the one thing my mom did. She'd wander around and talk to her. She had friends in memory care. They're all named Diane, which was kind of crazy. <laughs> we, had, we had Diane, my mom. We had other Diane. And then for a while, we had other, other Diane. <laughs> it was just like, 
it was confusing enough for those of us who don't have problems with our memories with those poor ladies. It was, it was very difficult to, you know, you'd, you'd ask my mom, where's your friend, Diane? I'm Diane. I know the other one. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> it, it was like that. Um, I think it's Laurel and Hardy. Who's on first. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a lot like that. And I just, I never understood why part of it was, it was probably about six or seven miles away and you had to pass like four schools to get mm-hmm. there. So that, you know, and I guess maybe mornings weren't a good thing for them anymore. I don't know. I never got a rational, I don't want to say excuse, but I never got a rational thought as to why he didn't want to do it. And I know it would have been really good for her and it would have, <clears throat> would have been good for him too, but he just was like, Nope, not going. I'm like, okay. It was like, I can't drag you there. I can't yeah. drag both of them there. So yeah, I'm, that's why I really encourage people, the sooner, the earlier that these conversations begin, the earlier this planning happens, um, it actually provides a sense of control for senior adults. Because if they can actually have a say in what they want or don't want and how they would like their lives to go forward, it really and truly provides that dignity that so many people are looking for either from the adult children for their parents and or from the senior adults themselves. Um, And what happens is a lot of times uh, I run into situations where the adult children uh, are in denial about what's going on with their parents. And so they say to me, well, I, I don't want to try to tell them what to do. And I want them to have control and to have dignity. And I'm like, well, yeah, me too. But there's a, also a safety factor. There's also, uh, you know, not only safety for them and their body and their mind, but there's also safety around scams and money. And, you know, if we take care of those things and if you do it early enough and the senior adult, whoever this is for, does this early enough, then you can put those things down. And if, you know, I know everything's digital today, but I still like paper. Uh, and if you write it down and it's in black and white and they sign it, then you kind of have an idea that that may be what they meant. Maybe they meant it at that time, but, you know, at least you have an understanding of what they were thinking and how they were feeling. And that's so, so important. The thing about the guardian's gift that's interesting that way is because I, I started this in 2018 after dad passed or 2019, actually early. Um, because of COVID, <laughs> I, had, I had to pivot. And so it is online. People can access it. There's three different levels of it. Uh, the base level, the very uh, smallest package that, that people can, they can do it themselves. And they can just go online and answer the questions. There's fill in the blank forms. And, you know, you just answer the questions. And when you, it guides you. And when you get to the end, if you've done all the steps that it provides for you, you end up with everything documented. You end up with pictures and everything you need. And you can put it in a book for yourself. So there is a do-it-yourself version. But some people really want some help and they need a little extra help. And so I have curation guides that actually you can make an appointment with and they will guide you through the whole process and they will work with you until you get it completed. And then, of course, there's a top end where you can work with me one on one. And that's, you know, a a whole different animal altogether. But the thing about the do it yourself one that I think is kind of neat that I've suggested to several people is for the adult child to actually do it. And they actually ask the questions of the senior adult and they fill in the questionnaire for them. And that way they have this really beautiful, absolutely wonderful opportunity to sit with them and actually collect the stories and do it for them. So it can be a family function. Uh, A grandchild could do it with their, you know, their grandparent. Of course, I'm talking about an older grandchild. Um, but to sit down and actually, because a lot of the seniors are not technologically savvy. It's gotten so better I, after tw- after 2020, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So because of, you know, having to do this, I thought, well, we need to put it online. So it is online. Now, on February the 15th, right after I think you said we're going to air, you're going to air this on the 9th. So mm-hmm. people will be hearing this on the 9th. 
But on February the 15th, I'm actually going to be leading a class. I'm going to do my own guardian's gift in front of everybody so they can see how to do that. So if they're interested in being part of that, they'll need to contact me and let me know. That sounds wonderful. And I love the idea of like a teenage grandchild going through the questionnaires with their grandparent, because we all know it at teenage years that you know, we don't really want to hang out with our grandparents, especially if they're not, you know, kind of with it, which is, right. and I just think that's a real, that's a beautiful gift to give each other. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's a really fantastic suggestion. And having all of these questions answered for yourself, like if I was the senior and I knew I had all, all this, all the ducks in a row, as my dad liked to say, it takes a huge burden and a bunch of stress off of you. And we know that stress is toxic for our bodies and our brains. So there's a good thing. And it also takes a lot of stress off the family. You don't have to worry about this stuff. You don't have to argue with the sibling. And I don't know how often, I don't think I've told this story too often, but my dad was a t- retiree of the phone company. And we went to cancel his cell phone because obviously after he died, he didn't need it. My mom couldn't possibly manage a cell phone at that point in her stage of Alzheimer's. And so I call and I have a death certificate handy and we have the electronic faxing capabilities because my husband is a real estate broker. And so I call up and I say, you know, that he's passed away and I need to, to cancel his phone service. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. Can you give me his pin? No, I cannot. <laughs> oh, okay. So we I had to go through three people four or five times telling them he died. It's like, it's a good thing I've got like kind of a tough shell because mm-hmm. having to repeatedly tell the phone company that my dad died. He died, he died, he died, he died, he died. It's like, come on, people. This is getting a little cruel. Oh, and then we had to go to the actual AT&T store to handle canceling. It was so frustrating. <laughs> And it took an hour plus the phone calls. It's like, ah, uh, it's just, it was just one of those things. That's very traumatic. And people need to understand that, you know, when you, somebody you love dies, even if you know it's coming, it's still trauma. You know, as a psychotherapist, it's, I deal with people and trauma all the time. And so when every time you have to repeat it, you're reliving that trauma and it does, it just takes it just breaks your heart, makes you angry. Uh, it's frustrating and it induces stress that none of us need. So if that can be handled, you know, and you pull out the page, the book, and you open up your guardian's gift and there's a page with all the pin numbers and passwords and everything listed, uh, how great is that? I mean, you say, here we go. This is it. And so I just updating passwords because I, my something, one of my passwords, I got a notification that this has been found on the dark web. Okay, that doesn't sound good. And so I've had to change, you know, and some some online websites and, you know, financial institutions, you got to change your password regularly. So it almost needs to be like a quarterly check-in. It's like, which passwords am I using for which places? <laughs> because I must, I have multiple ones now. And if my computer didn't remember them, I'd be in trouble. Yeah. Hey, I understand, but, you know, I hope nobody ever gets a hold of my computer because I use it for business and everything. And speaking of pin numbers and passwords, I must have 500 different ones, you know, for all the different business things that I do. So um, it's important. Sometimes if I didn't write them down, I couldn't remember them. (laughs) So I I try to to use things that are, they're personal but they're not necessarily easy to guess. Right. So, and, you know, so I had to go away from the easier one. <laughs> and now they want like the symbols and I, yeah, yeah, that drives me bananas. Cause that's the num that's the piece I always forget. So yeah. but it is important because we have a friend whose father passed away many, many years ago. Nobody has the password to his Facebook page. And every so often something pops up from his dad's Facebook page. Like his dad pops up on Facebook, even though his dad's been gone. It might be close to 10 years now. Yeah. And he just kind of says, that's my dad's way of stopping in and saying hello. But, you know, if you're having a really bad day or there's some other trauma going on and your deceased parent pops up on Facebook, 
that might not be such a pleasant experience. So, and I know it's easier now than it used to be, but it's not easy to get Facebook to, if you don't have the password, they won't do anything with the page. So, right. Right. It's, it's, there's a lot of digital things we need to keep track of these days. There are a lot of digital things. One of the things that's nice about the Guardian's Gift is um, for the t- the top two levels, we actually give you a, a, a flash drive with everything on it. So, um, and at the, the bottom, the do-it-yourself version, I encourage people to put it on a flash drive and so that it can be updated periodically as needed. The stories will remain the same. Most of everything on there will be the same for a long, long time. But the pin numbers and passwords, at least they're somewhere. And, you know, it's in a one location. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing is to have things where I don't have to go look for everything. Uh, I know when dad passed, the one thing I couldn't find, the very one document that I needed pretty quickly for his funeral was his discharge papers from service. And I was like, Okay, mom, where is it? She said, well, it's in that drawer. Well, it wasn't in that drawer. And I actually, you know, we had to find it. And it was, that was a thing. So there's always something. And so I try to make sure that I cover all those bases for people and ask all those questions. Um, I know I was working with a man who had stage four cancer. And He'd been married before. His wife had been married before. And so a lot of times when people get remarried and 50% rate of divorce in this country and remarriage, um, they don't update things. They don't keep things current. So that's another way that, that I help people with that. But when he passed away and he his family opened his guardian's gift book, they were like, what? We didn't know all this stuff about him. We didn't know that he was a drum major for the band in college. We did not know that he was in this organization and that organization and held leadership positions. We didn't know a lot of these things. And so uh, even the funeral home said, God, I can't believe, where did this come from? Who did this? We, this is awesome. So it's really amazing how detailed it can be. I believe it. One of the things, you know, because my, Maternal great grandmother, my maternal grandmother, and my mom all had memory loss at the end of their lives. It's amazing how much family history is missing. Mm -hmm. And one of my New Year's goals, because we're supposed to move again sometime in 2021, is to go through all of the photographs that I collected from my parents' house after my dad died and go through them with my mom's youngest brother, because I know. I mean, it's obviously one of two sides of the family, and I don't want any more history to get lost because, you know, we don't take the time to do that. So he and I have a quasi date to do that. He knows kind of like she passed away in March. We sold their house in July, and I told him I was going to do this. So right before Thanksgiving, I texted him and said, you know, I haven't forgotten. Let's just take care of it like after the beginning of the year. So that's our plan. You know, and it's it should be, I think it'll be kind of fun. So I might have to get the do-it-yourself kit and start filling it out because I don't want to lose any of the, any more family history. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, one of the things that's kind of, you know, talking about pictures kind of spurred something, made me remember. Uh, one of the things that we do is I encourage people and at the top end of this that I do for people is they have heirlooms and they have, you know, jewelry and things that don't necessarily go in a wheel and are not specified. So we actually help them get pictures of the items and we get it, get them evaluated and get them priced out what their value is. And then I actually encourage the, them to go ahead and put names on those things and list it in their guardian's gift book that keeps down all the squabbles at the end. Um, but it's it's a neat thing to do because then when they're going through it, like you're talking about going through the pictures, then you can actually, you know, say what this memory is, where this came from, this particular, just say a buffet. Um, this buffet belonged to great great grandmother, and it was brought over across the plains to you know to California on a covered wagon or whatever. Uh, the story is, 
but it's it's neat to have a picture of the item and to have the value of the item as well as the story of the item and then who gets the item because surprisingly sometimes in families somebody will inherit something and it really doesn't mean as much to them the the senior adults trying to recognize them in some way but then there's another family member that's like oh i really like that well then you can gift it to them and say well here's the story here's the picture and the history's not lost yeah that sounds really nice so i like let, that idea so let me encourage you that when you go through the pictures my my wisdom for you today is be sure to go ahead and label the picture with a date with the people who are in it because so many times you'll pull out a picture and there's people there and you know some of them but you're like well I don't know who that is and so label the pictures that's mm-hmm. really important use a sharpie on the back not a ballpoint pen that's my photographer voice speaking right um and I've done that with my own personal um photographs because Mm -hmm. I'm a very organized person and my mom and my grandmother were not my maternal grandmother. And that's why I have hundreds of photographs where I'll recognize, I think that's my maternal grandfather. That's my paternal grandmother. That's also how I confirmed that I inherited the fat gene. There's a (laughs) family story that I think it was my dad's great aunts were fat ladies in the circus. And there is a photograph. It's an eight by 10 um sepia tone photograph that shows you how old it is sepia tone is brown and white and it's i think about six people three or four women so i think it's like four women two men unfortunately very very large people and they're definitely in what looks like behind the scenes circus situation which is you know now we're at 2021 that's really horrible but This was like, this was probably back in the early 1900s. So we've come a long way since then. I'm glad we don't mock people and put the, put overweight people in the circus, but that, you know, I'd always heard the story. That's beautiful though. And I'll have to get with my, my aunt or maybe my dad's youngest brother and go through those photos, but that's a little trickier, but Uh both sides of the family, like my grandfather and my mom, her dad did some genealogy and they ran into an issue with a, should be my two time great grandmother was allegedly a native American. And my daughter and I did the 23 me DNA test and there's no native American DNA. So I'm not really sure. I got to connect those two dots or somehow, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if the DNA I don't know. I mean, it, it wasn't that long ago that they did that, where they were doing the family tree. It was like in the late 90s, which, of course, now does sound like a long time ago. <laughs> but, you know, Native Americans didn't have government papers, so it made sense that they ran into this roadblock. And I don't know. My sister always said I was the mailman's baby, even though I'm the oldest of the two. <laughs> so I, You never know. There might be. They always tell you when you do the DNA test to be prepared for a surprise. And yeah. so I was very anxious, you know, being blonde and I sunburn at the drop of a hat. I was like, I will laugh myself silly if there are, you know, African DNA in our family. Not only is there not, it is all white people, which that was a surprise. I'm like, seriously, this family, now I'm a little curious, I'm a little more curious and a little scared because it's all British, Western European, like predominantly scotland which yeah. my dad's family's name is graham so that's not a surprise but it's like how can you have only white people that's just insane i am like you i'm very very pale very white burn very easily blue eyes but we have some pretty deep african-american roots in our family uh and so my mother was like what and, and i was like yeah guess what dna doesn't lie that's pretty Pretty drastic. Uh, I've actually met some of my cousins in that in that arena. So it's cool. We might redo it and add my husband and do the medical part of the genetics. We were just talking about that the other day. 
But yeah, it's just very fascinating. And these are all the stories that we, we appreciate them more, I find, as we age. I had a project for 2020. It was a shocker, listening to a podcast. And people remember I'm a, also a photographer. And they were talking about postcards and like their unique place in history and in our personal history. Mm-hmm. And then I was thinking about social media, which is kind of like a modern day postcard for daily life. And my brain clicked those two things together. I'm like, I should do like just a little scrapbook of like what daily life is like. Not every day because every day is not that interesting. Well, holy Toledo, I picked the right year to do that. <laughs> yes, you did. So it's it's interesting to kind of see like, here is how daily life works in 2020 when we had to stay home all the time. And there's, you know, there's a lot of dog photos, in there. <laughs> but it's like, you know, I used to go to the gym and now we work out at home and there's pictures of me, you know, doing a workout with the dog attached to the dog toy. And it's just like, cause she wants to play and, you know, it's just, and my husband using wine bottles cause you can't buy dumbbells right now because for whatever reason, those are a pandemic um, scarcity. It's just, you know, it's, and I know, and I've gone back and read parts of it already. I know in 20 years when my daughter is ooh, 50, <laughs> choke, <laughs> um, it'll be so fascinating. And it's like, it's this piece of history. It's my history. And, but it's also this piece of history of what happened in 2020. So it's, it's been a fun little project, even though I had to document my mom died and the oldest dog died, you know, that's all part of our natural, our, our lives, but it's been, it's just crazy. It's like, so now I'm going to do it every year and hopefully 2021 won't be so strange. <laughs> You're making a wonderful point because I, I was telling somebody that the other day, I said, you know, somewhere down the road, m- my great grandchildren or uh, will look at, I was telling my grandchild this. I said, your grandchildren are going to look back at you and say, you mean you lived during the pandemic way back then? <laughs> and of course, they were like, oh, Mimi, stop. You know, and I'm like, they're good. I'm telling you, it'll happen. So this is important, you know. And also, you made an, another really good point, too, that everything is digital. Everything is Facebook. Everything we don't. Even our pictures we take with our phones and we don't print them out like we used to. But I, again, I in the Guardian's gift, I encourage people to have an actual picture that is in the book so that when their family members look at it, it's, it's just different holding that picture in your hand somehow. I don't know. Um, it's really important. Okay, back to the photographer hat. Years and years ago when digital was pretty much fully adopted, but still new. So mid the mid early 2000s, the mid aughts, there was a professional article on what was the best way to archive your digital photographs. Do you keep them on the memory card that goes in your camera, which at that point would have been a very expensive option. Mm -hmm. Do You put them on the gold CDs, which I'm not even sure they have anymore. Do you put them on DVDs? There was a bunch of options. And it, the conclusion with these photographic curators, professional photographers, you know, like people like from Nat Geo and that, that type of level and wedding photographers was the best way to preserve your, your f- photographs is to print them. And I'm not talking about on your home printer because those will fade. Yeah. You want to actually send them to a place that runs them through the chemicals, which I'm I'm kind of not I try I'm trying to rid my life of chemicals, but that's the only place at this point that I think they're getting better with the ink on the paper that doesn't go through the chemicals. Mm -hmm. But yeah, print them because if you're I had a client whose phone got stolen and she hadn't backed them up, lost a ton of photos. I took a my I went to Jamaica for my 50th birthday. Now my professional camera has two card slots. One it shoots on and one is a backup, but it's big and bulky and heavy. And so I rented a camera that I thought I could put in the bag on my bike because this was a bike trip across the island of Jamaica. And it wasn't quite that small. And we were there. It was like a it was a week trip. I think we were there. We had like two or three days left. And the 
memory card died. So I'm like, okay, you know, I know what I'm doing. I put it in its little plastic case. So I will run the recovery software when I get home. Recovery software did not work because what happened, we're talking the little tiny quarter inch by half inch card, right? Right. The control panel on the card died. Oh. So being close to Silicon Valley, I did call, I did contact some professional photographers that I knew that did recovery. And one guy's like, well, if you haven't done anything to it, probably be a couple hundred bucks. Um, mail it to me. And I'm like, mm, no, I don't think I want to put this in the mail. So my husband drove it to San Jose, which is about a little over an hour away from where we live to a basically digital data recovery company, $1,450. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. So it was a very expensive little stupid card. And I have, sw- and I have sworn ever since then, I will not use a quote unquote real camera. It does not have two cards in it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, they got probably 90 or so percent of them. They got most of them, but not all of them. And so, you know, so they have to take the little teeny card apart, replace the controller panel, download and decrypt the information, and then put those files someplace else. And then they have to re encrypt them. It's like, Holy Toledo, what a headache. (laughs) So print your pictures, people. That way you don't have to learn the uh, ins and outs of digital data recovery. (laughs) And put them in your guardian's gift book so that your real will have them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think once, you know, you could keep them on your phone and you could, you know, there's all kinds of ways to print them. So I'm actually going to take my little 2020 scrapbook because it's only like a six by nine book, but it doesn't close at all anymore because it's got actual photographs in it. And I'm going to recreate it and have it printed digitally and professionally. But I'm going to keep the original because it's special. It is special. It's very special. So since we're recording this on New Year's Eve 2020, I've been thinking about what the last page of the book is going to say. I might wait a couple more days and see how today rolls out. But, you know, this has been a year. <laughs> I think the strangest year to start documenting daily life. <laughs> but it's so important. And like I said, at some point, somewhere down the road, somebody's going to say, I am so glad that Jennifer Fink recorded this and has this documentation about what daily life was like for 2020. You know what? You made me think. Since I will technically have two copies of it, I will donate the original to our historical society in here in town. Oh, that's awesome. Definitely. Going to write that down so I don't forget later. (laughs) What's interesting is our Rotary group, our Rotary club, went to online meetings on March 23rd. And I know that because it's written down in the book with a little photo, a little screenshot of our little meeting. (laughs) So that's why the Guardian's Gift is... That's exactly, it's written down in the book, all the directions, all the thoughts, all the hopes and wishes and what we want to happen. And someday somebody will look back on it and go, so that's what they did during the pandemic. Yeah. (laughs) That's what 2020 life looked like in a typical suburban town in, you know, a major country. I know California has its own country, right? No, (laughs) in a major (laughs) city. Oh, no, it's. In a state. There we go. I'm okay. And because i that's the history that I like is like you go see the tools that the Victorian women used in the kitchen and you think, oh, yikes. You know, I'm glad I have my power tools in the kitchen. But it's fascinating. You know, all the war and history and government stuff. That's not my thing. I like the daily life. And that's why I started recording it. Yeah. So this has been fantastic. This was a perfect way to end the year. It is though, a perfect way. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And everybody can click on the hot link in the show notes if you're in your podcast player. It's just down underneath the description of today's episode and check out Guardian's Gift. Obviously, there are three options that you can take advantage of, and we should all take advantage of at least one of them. So I appreciate it tremendously that you came on today with me, Judy, and here's to an awesome 2021. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. 2021, here we come. Definitely. 
Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.